This episode of the Children's Literature Podcast is brought to you by Dinner Negotiations. Dinner Negotiations. Precisely how many carrots do the kids have to eat in order to earn dessert? Welcome to the Children's Literature Podcast. I'm your host, TQ Townsend. This is a review of the third episode of Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Here's your spoiler warning. If you haven't read the Percy Jackson books by Rick Reardon, or seen any of the new TV adaptation, go read the books, then watch the show, then come on back. Episode 3 of Percy Jackson and the Olympians, We Visit the Garden Gnome Emporium, adapts chapters 9 through 11 of The Lightning Thief by Rick Reardon. The opening scene is actually pretty spooky, like no little kids allowed. If this was an episode of Scooby-Doo, then the moment that creepy old mummy started shooting green smoke out of its mouth, Shaggy and Scooby would have noped out of there faster than you can say zoinks. But don't worry, as the green creepy smoke just takes the form of Gabe, Percy's loser stepdad. As I mentioned in my episode 1 review, Gabe's character is very different from the guy in the book. He's not intimidating or abusive in the TV show. He comes across more like an annoying roommate, which is why Percy's disgusted and not frightened when the Oracle takes on Gabe's appearance to deliver a prophecy. The Oracle tells Percy that now he's finally made it to camp, he has to leave. Because somebody stole Zeus's favorite thunderbolt, and Zeus thinks that the somebody is his brother's stinking kid, Percy. That's right, Percy's suspect number one. This can seem irrational, but I'm sympathetic to Zeus. No, no, hear me out. This one time, my little sister wanted my Halloween candy, but she didn't want to get caught taking it. So she convinced my little brother to steal it for her. Of course I found out, and oh boy, let me tell you, it's a good thing that as a kid, my only superpowers were whining, tattling, and stink eye, because if I could have thrown thunderbolts, I would have. Anyway, now it's quest time. Chiron assembles all the straight-A students to explain that if Zeus doesn't get his lightning bolt back, he's going to escalate things from pouting to global thermonuclear war. Two of the campers will now be assigned to be Percy's BFFs. Chiron says Hades is probably the real lightning thief, so they have to go to his house and steal it back. Then he says that the entrance to the underworld is in Los Angeles, and hey! As a proud Angelino, I'd just like to say, yeah, okay, that's fair enough. Grover and Annabeth become Percy's Ron and Hermione, and off they go. Three unsupervised kids on a do-or-die mission. So far, the episode has followed the book pretty closely. From here, there are changes, like when Percy gets 200 bucks from the camp to spend on his trip. In the book, he only gets 100 bucks, but then, given the brutal levels of inflation in the 20 years since The Lightning Thief was published, this is justifiable. The part where Grover tries to get Percy and Annabeth to sing the consensus song with him is great. This is also not in the book, and at first I was like, oh no, this is a Disney show, they might actually all burst into song. But then, the only thing that the consensus song achieves is that Percy and Annabeth reach the consensus that this show is not a musical. Though, I have to complain once again that the show is not developing Annabeth's character properly. The show has captured her tendency to not just be blunt, but actually rude, but so far it's failed to balance that with her dark, witty sense of humor and her ability to lighten up and have a laugh once in a while. By this point in the book, we've seen Annabeth laugh, joke, and smile enough times with Percy that the friendship is off to a good start. So far, the show hasn't let Annabeth show any warmth or happiness at all, and it's hurting the idea that she and Percy will ever be friends. The writers did condense the plot well. In the book, all three harpies attack the kids on a bus while it's driving through the Lincoln Tunnel. The bus crashes and bursts into flames as Percy fights the harpies. This would have made the episode too long and, more importantly, way too expensive. So instead of blowing the budget, the show has the Furies follow them onto the bus, where Annabeth kills one. They give the other one the slip, but then she follows them to Medusa's house, and Percy kills her there. Medusa in the book is a pretty straightforward villain. The kids stumble onto her roadside shop, and she makes them lunch. They only figure out who she is when she asks them to strike a pose for a picture, and they realize she wants to turn them to stone. In the show, things get more complicated and, I have to admit, more interesting. Percy and his friends are running from the last fury when they reach Medusa's lair. The kids are caught between two deadly monsters, but as Medusa points out, 
that one wants to tear you limb from limb, and I'm offering you lunch. This Medusa is very different from the one in The Lightning Thief, both in appearance and personality. In the book, she wears black from head to toe in a fashion that reminds Percy of a niqab, except even her eyes are covered. I bet they changed this in the show partly because people would have gotten angry on the internet about whether or not it was okay to show a literal monster in an outfit that resembles religious attire. But I bet it was mainly that a woman draped under a black sheet would be an expressionless dark blob on screen, and both the costume designer and the actor would be severely limited. So instead, they gave her a nice 1930s look with a hat and short veil. This lets Medusa remain mysterious and scary, while giving the actor the very interesting challenge of acting with only her mouth fully visible. Medusa's personality is also totally different from the book. Disney has had a recent trend of trying to make villains sympathetic, and mostly this doesn't work. This time they did make me sympathize with a villain, but unfortunately it was incompatible with where the plot of the story needed to go. Medusa is still dangerous in the TV adaptation, but she's reasonable. She's courteous and kind. She was unfairly punished by Athena because of something Poseidon did, but she doesn't hold a grudge against their innocent children. She shelters them from the attacking fury because she doesn't like bullies. Medusa even has an interesting and surprisingly positive view of being given snake hair and the ability to turn people to stone with one glance. The gift the gods gave me, she says, is that I cannot be bullied anymore. Medusa has had enough of the gods and their games, and she tries to persuade the three children that they don't have to give blind obedience and unquestioning love to the gods, who give them nothing in return. She redefines herself from a monster to a survivor. Parents and teachers can use this moment to talk with their kids about the relationship Percy and Annabeth have with the gods. Annabeth's unflinching, unquestioning devotion to her mother, Athena, is a pretty good example of how people in ancient Greece were expected to behave. You didn't question the gods. You didn't make demands of them. They're forces beyond your comprehension, and you are nothing in comparison. Humans considered themselves to be utterly beneath the gods of Olympus, who could show favor or wrath at any moment without having to justify themselves. Medusa rejects this idea, preferring to carve out her own little kingdom and live by her own rules. In this way, she has a lot in common with the figure of Lucifer from Paradise Lost. I don't recommend having your fourth grader read John Milton, but you can use the character of Medusa to introduce some of the ideas in the poem and find out how kids feel about her choices. Would it be better to eternally and faithfully remain obedient to gods like Athena and Poseidon? Or does it make more sense to reject them, as they'll never really return the love they're given or even play according to fair rules? Medusa in the TV show is a genuinely interesting character. The problem is that it's not what the plot needs her to be. The plot needs her to get her head chopped off so Percy can FedEx it to Mount Olympus. In the book, this didn't present Percy with a moral conundrum because Medusa just straight up tried to kill him. The funny thing is that, as eager as the TV writers were to make Medusa more complex, they didn't use the one thing from the book that gave the character depth. In the book, Medusa can't help but admire Annabeth's stunning gray eyes, which she has inherited from her mother. These are the very eyes that would have stared at Medusa with such wrath before Athena pronounced her curse. For whatever reason, the producers of the show did not give Annabeth gray eyes. This would have been so easy to do with computer effects or just some contact lenses. And her gray eyes are actually really important to the plot and Annabeth's character at more than one point in the Percy Jackson series. Annabeth literally and metaphorically sees the world differently from others because she has the eyes of Athena Glaucopis, or grey-eyed Athena. The interaction between Annabeth and Medusa in the show would have been so poignant if, as Medusa described how much she had admired Athena, she got a little choked up saying that Annabeth's eyes made her remember how much she admired the beauty and wisdom of the goddess. A lot of times the physical traits of a character don't matter to the character's development or the general plot of the story. In these cases, I don't think you need to keep them in mind when it comes to casting or costume design. But when those traits do matter, it's a mistake to leave them out, and I think it was a mistake not to give Annabeth gray eyes, especially when it would have been very inexpensive and easy for the filmmakers to do so. So, the show's built up this fascinating, complex character, but then it just has to throw her away. Medusa shows hospitality, intelligence, patience, and sympathy. The plot can't let the kids consider what she has to say, though. So Annabeth is hostile, rude, and closed-minded, interrupting to say, 
That is not what happened, and you are a liar. In this moment, you can see that Medusa is hurt and frustrated. Even then, she makes no threats. She warns Percy that the others will try to stop him from saving his mother, and she only offers to kill them if that's what he really wants. This is a very different moral situation for Percy than from what happens in the book, and it would have been nice if there was time for him to wrestle with that a bit more. After this, the plot needs Medusa to just click over into monster mode, so the interesting character goes away and there's a pretty decent boss fight. This is just like my opinion, but I would have liked it better if they never showed Medusa's full face during this scene. I think she would have been much more intimidating if that was left to the imagination. But either way, once again, Medusa is beheaded by a kid named Perseus. As in the book, Percy sends the head to Mount Olympus over the warnings of his friends that this is impertinent, stating frankly, I am impertinent. So this episode was flawed, but incredibly thought-provoking. Most of the changes from the novel are examples of how to abridge a story well, but I've got mixed feelings about the major changes to Medusa. The writers crafted a complex, fascinating character, but all of those ideas go nowhere because the only purpose her character serves to the story is to offer up a boss fight and then provide her head for future use in the plot. I give adaptations of children's books a rating of one to five Snapes, based on how faithfully the story on the page is translated to the screen. Despite the fact that I think this is an excellent episode of the show, I have to give it only three Snapes because of the huge changes to Medusa. Everything about her is different from the literary original, from her appearance to her motives, goals, and actions. What did you think of Episode 3 of Percy Jackson and the Olympians? Let me know what you and your kids thought of it. You've been listening to the Children's Literature Podcast. Please subscribe and give the show a rating. Send comments to letters at childrensliteraturepodcast.com. I'm your host, TQ Townsend. Thanks for listening.